forward to the cloud. Okay, I think we're good. <laughs> Thanks everyone for bearing with us. Um, my name is Phoebe Taylor. I'm with Resource Central. Um, Resource Central is a Boulder nonprofit that's been around since um, the mid 70s. We offer a wide range of conservation programs in three main areas. Waste diversion at our reuse facility in Boulder, energy conservation with our Renew Our Schools competition, um, which is now national, and our water conservations through low water landscaping and sprinkler efficiency evaluations. Um, Resource Central partners with local water providers like the city of Boulder, who's sponsoring today's webinar. Um, and actually we'll hear from Aspen and Ariana in just a minute um, from the city of Boulder. Um, but first of all, Boulder partners with us um, to offer um, not just this webinar, but also lawn replacement program discounts as well as um, free slow the flow sprinkler evaluations. Um, if you have any questions about our programs um, to you as a Boulder resident or anyone who's joining our call today, uh, it's a benefit of webinars these days. Um, don't has out, hesitate to reach out, um, info at resourcecentral.org. We'd be happy to direct you in the right area. Um, so I wanted to start off um, excited for today's webinar, Rain Gardens and their benefits with Jessica Thrasher. Um, a couple logistics. We are recording today's session, as you probably just saw. Um, and we also will be sending out some slides after today's session as well. Um, I know I, I often get those um, questions, so I'll just say that right up, up front. Um, in the meantime, if you have any questions throughout the presentation or need something repeated, um, you can use the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. Um, it'll appear when you sort of hover at the bottom of your screen. Um, and that's, I'll be monitoring questions in there um, so, and, and presenting them during question breaks to Jessica. Um, so feel free to drop any questions there. Um, let's see. Yes, there will be question breaks throughout the presentation. And let's see, any unanswered questions, if you're really dying for an answer and we did not get to it, feel free to reach out at turfremoval at resourcecentral.org and we'd be happy to get you an answer. Um, Let's see, other than that, uh, you'll be getting a survey after today's um, webinar. We would love for you to fill it out. We're also doing a um, sort of raffle. Anyone who fills out the survey will be entered to win a $250 Visa gift card, which is always great. Um, and also, if you love it, leave us a Google review. Um, we love seeing those pop up. So um, thanks so much. And at this point, I'm gonna pass it over to Aspen and Ariana from City of Boulder, who had a couple words, I believe. Yes, thank you for the introduction. Yeah. Um, we're gonna go ahead and introduce you to the Cool Boulder campaign today. Um, I don't know, Ariana, if you had anything to get us started or if you want me to just take it. Just say we're really excited to be telling you about the Cool Boulder campaign today. Uh, it's fairly new. Uh, it hasn't even been launched yet, so you all are getting a little sneak preview. And uh, Aspen is another uh, CU Masters of the Environment student who is working on the Cool Boulder campaign as uh, part of her capstone project. We're really excited to be working with the Masters of the Environment program to help launch this campaign. And I'll pass it off to Aspen. Thank you. Um... Next slide, please. Awesome. All right. So, sorry, you can go ahead and go to the next. All right. Hello. Hi, everybody, and welcome. Um, my name is Aspen, as people have said, and I am here representing the city of Boulder to introduce you all to the Cool Boulder campaign tonight. Um, you can go ahead and go to the next slide. So, I'll tell you a little bit about what the Cool Boulder campaign is. And it is a long-term campaign, really something that's going to be taking place over the next 10 to 20 years here in Boulder. And the goal is really to create partnerships between the city of Boulder, the people of Boulder, and local partner organizations to implement natural climate solutions here in the city. Um, go ahead and go to the next slide. 
So there are really three major focus areas that we're putting our action and attention into. Um, these areas are the connected corridors piece, pollinator pathways, and absorbent landscapes. So I wanna talk a little bit about each of these individual action areas. Hopefully this will help you all understand why we're choosing to do this campaign. So the connected corridors piece is really about urban forestry here in the city of Boulder and in the surrounding area. Um, the goals here are to help reduce temperatures, expand access to the benefits of urban trees, maintain the health of the existing tree canopy, and also really just to plant as many trees as we can, hopefully thousands of trees um, over the next few years. And we're going to be doing this mostly on private lands. Secondly, we're focused on creating pollinator pathways. Um, the goals with this piece are to create diverse plant corridors that support cooling temperatures and also support biodiversity. So we're creating habitat for native pollinators. We are connecting corridors on both public and private lands. And also we're working towards managing carbon and water in ways that reduce the impacts of climate change. So the third piece here is that of absorbent landscapes. And this is kind of a broader category, um, but it's equally as important. And the goals here are to improve carbon sequestration in soils, to improve soil health, um, the water retention capacity of the soils, promoting regenerative agriculture, in addition to sustainable grasslands and turf, as well as creating more absorbent landscapes within the city and around the city on working lands. So we're actually just going to start this campaign officially next Friday with our Earth Day tree planting campaign. And this has been really dominated by the organization by local high school students of Boulder Valley School District. Um, they've been doing an awesome job and they've reached their goal of planting um, over 2000 trees. So we're really excited to help volunteer with that and really watch them uh, launch the Cool Boulder campaign. So we really want to encourage everyone that's attending this webinar and all other members of the Boulder community to think about joining us in this initiative. It's really something that we will need a lot of help with from the community, and there are many opportunities to get involved. Um, the Earth Day planting, like I said, is just the kickoff, but there will be a lot of opportunities in the future to join us. So one way you can do this is to become a partner organization with the city of Boulder. Um, these are the existing partners that we have established so far, but it's a growing list. And then another opportunity is to join a climate action team. So there are four different teams that we've established so far. The plant and protect team, grow and give. Uh, you can also become a community resource specialist or a community scientist. And you can sign up to get more information about each of these teams on our website. So with that, I just wanted to thank you all for allowing me to introduce the campaign tonight. We're really excited to have you join us. And like I said, you can get a lot of more information on our website, coolboulder.org. I'm also going to post a document in the chat that has some resources for you to take a peek at. And that document will also be sent out by email in the next couple of days. So thank you. You're muted, Phoebe. Oops. Sorry. Um, thanks, Aspen and Ariana. I'm going to go ahead and just pass it right over to Jessica Thrasher and let her introduce herself. Thanks so much. Thank you so much. Really excited to be here with you all tonight. Thank you to Resource Central in the city of Boulder for making this class possible today. Rain gardens and their benefits. 
So here's just a little bit about me. Um, I am at this Colorado Stormwater Center, which is at Colorado State University. And really those are my qualifications, but really I just love rainwater harvesting. I love educating, I love talking about it, and I love planting. So we'll be talking a lot about some really cool native plants. And I will show you this actual, the picture that I'm in here. This is my home rain garden. And I will be showing you how I built that rain garden as part of the example of how you can have one in your house. Um, it's coming up here too. So the Colorado Stormwater Center, in case you haven't heard of us before, we advance stormwater management throughout Colorado by conducting practical research and providing education and training opportunities like these. We have three or four, we have four main um, things that we do. One is this training, and we also have certifications, stormwater certifications for stormwater managers. And then we've been also doing more outreach to homeowners, HOAs, landscapers as well. We also have a strong focus on language justice and I'm really excited to have um, language justice during this um, event here tonight as well. We also do stormwater research and have a number of stormwater resources on our website. We also have a symposium every year and that date, save the date, will be at the end of September and more information will be coming out later um, on our website. Throughout the presentation today, you will be seeing these this blue lettering, and that is direct links that will take you to more information about um, whatever that topic is. Um, as was already mentioned, you'll be receiving these slides and this presentation will be recorded in both languages in case you need to review it um, or share it with a friend. So for today, we have a lot to talk about. Uh, we're going to start with the need to conserve water, um, go into what rainwater harvesting is, talk about the difference between active and passive rainwater harvesting, and then we're really going to get into all the steps needed to install your rain garden, talk about what native plants you can use, how to do a design and layout, and then how all of us working together really make a difference. So briefly, the reason why we're having these this, like this whole seminar series and the talk today is because we have decreased water availability here in Colorado. We're seeing more droughts um, and less snowpack, which means to less water in the rivers. We're also having increases in population. Many people like myself moved here, loved it and stayed. And so we are having um, huge increases in the Colorado population, which is really putting pressure on our water systems. There are also increasing priorities for water on our rivers. So we have municipal or drinking water uses. We have industry using the water. Um, environmental uses, how much water needs to be in the river to protect aquatic health. We have recreation uses, how much water needs to be in the river um, for adequate recreation. And of course, we have agriculture and how much water needs to be diverted for the growing of crops. Climate change has really had some major impacts on our water as well, as you all know, from drought to fires. Drought and fires are very much connected. As our forests aren't adequately hydrated, when a fire starts, they burn hotter and last longer, as um, folks in Boulder, of course, have had experience with very recently. And lastly, we have high water use. About half of the water that's used um, here in Colorado is used in outdoor irrigation in our warmer months. So there's about 160 to 200 gallons being used by the average American per day. And in half of that, 80 to 100 gallons is used outdoors. The majority of that is used on bluegrass lawns. And so I always like to give kind of this picture because with water, it's hard to know exactly how much you're using. So if you imagine a 100 square foot piece of lawn, um, which is about the size of a roughly an SUV, you use 128 to 186 gallons of water per week. And that is the difference between watering two times a week or watering three times a week. And so that might not sound like all that much water. So I wanted to talk about it in the perspective of the city of Boulder. The city of Boulder has roughly 45,000 homes. And if we can all agree that all of those homes have approximately a SUV sized lawn, and we know that a lot of them have more than that, then that's over 8 million gallons per week being used on lawns alone, which is a big number and it definitely adds up. 
Next is indoor water use. The water use indoors, um, the most water use indoors is in the toilet. And then next is shower. Um, one that might be surprising to you is dishwasher. Um, I run my dishwasher every day and it sounds like it might be a lot of water, but they're very efficient. And then the other thing I like to point out is leaks. So it's really important to get to get notified when you have leaks. Um, there are apps now that you can use. Um, up here, I'm in Fort Collins. We have, it's called Water Eye on Water. And I have an app that alerts me every time that there is a leak. And that is something that you can ask your local municipality about to see if there's something like that um, for you in your area as well. So what can we do? We know there's a problem, what can we do? We can purchase WaterSense products. Again, that is linked and you can go to that website and see all of the different WaterSense products which range from uh, toilets to shower heads to faucets to irrigation controllers. And the WaterSense products are certified through a third party to us, um, ensure that water efficiency standard is being met. I really love this image on the left because it just shows how much water is wasted that we don't know because we don't have a way that we see how many gallons we're using when it's just going you know, into our grass or along the curb um, when we're washing. When I've seen, if you've seen people washing their cars and then the water goes just into the curb. So um, City of Boulder, in addition to other municipalities, if you're joining us from other areas, please check with them. If you're going to be changing out to more water efficient systems anyway, there's a lot of rebates that you could potentially get from um, equipment rebates. There's also discounts from Resource Central's Garden in a Box. You could get grants for removing turf or installing xeric landscaping. There's indoor water rebates. Um, so be sure to check with your provider. If you're already going to make these changes, you should definitely get some money back. Okay, so now let's start into what is rainwater harvesting. Rainwater harvesting is the collecting, storing, and putting rainwater runoff to use at your house. It's really easy to use um, using your existing gutter system. Um, I always like, you know, I talk about rainwater harvesting a lot, and I found out that in Arizona, they don't put gutters on their houses. And so for people in Arizona who would like to use uh, rainwater harvesting, they need to first put those gutters on. So we're lucky here in that most houses already have gutters on them. So I really like this picture of this house as an example. So you can see that from the arrows that there are multiple gutters and downspouts going to one downspout location at the bottom left of this picture. So you can see here and you can might imagine that with all of that front part of that roof, all of that water going to one spot, they are going to have issues with water pooling right there. Um, there's probably gonna be mosquito issues right there, but that's also a perfect spot for a rain garden. Since you're using a lot of water or a lot of water is already going to that location, that would be a perfect spot to um, install one. Why should we do rainwater harvesting? It's free. It reduces the demand for treated municipal water, which is our drinking water. It'll help you save money on your water bills since, you know, if you're reducing the amount of water you're using on your outdoor landscape, that's a substantial amount of water that you'll be saving. And plants love it. Um, rainwater does not have salts in it. Um, since we're a headwater state here in Colorado, our water usually doesn't as well. But as the lower states that receive our water, like Arizona from the Colorado River, it's been used and reused so many times that it has a high amount of salt in that water. And in, sometimes you need um, you need water, from, rainwater rather, to um, flush out the salts in that system. A lot of times I get a question on how much rain we get in Colorado. That rainwater harvesting sounds great, but we don't get that much rain in Colorado, right? So I like to talk about how much rain we do get. In Boulder, you actually get over 20 inches of rain per year. In Fort Collins, we get around 16. Um, so you have a lot of rainfall um, going to you and plenty of rain to do rainwater harvesting. That still might not sound like that much rain, but a one inch rainfall on a 1000 square foot roof will yield over 600 gallons of water and over 12,000 gallons of water per year. There are two types of rainwater harvesting systems, active systems and passive systems. Active systems 
collect and store water for future use. An example of that is uh, rain barrels. So we actually just recorded a rain barrel um, class earlier with Resource Central and the blue links are the links to the English version of that recording. And then in the Spanish section is that's the Spanish recording. So if you're interested in learning more about how to install rain barrels at your house, please um, view those recordings. The other type of system is passive systems, and that is what we're here to talk about today. It uses gravity to direct and slow the flow of water, which allows for greater infiltration. I really loved hearing about the um, new initiative that the city of Boulder is doing, and rain gardens fit right into that with allowing more infiltration into the soil. Passive systems collect substantially more water than active systems. And the reason for that is in Colorado, we have the limit, we have a limitation on how much rainwater we can collect. Um, we can collect a total of 110 gallons um, in two 55 gallon barrels. Rain gardens can collect just a massive amount of water. In other states, they don't have the requirements for, or the restrictions rather, on how much rain you can collect. But even still, passive systems still collect a lot more water than active systems. So here is a picture on the left from the Rainwater Harvesting for the Drylands and Beyond by Brad Lancaster. And I like showing this picture because we really need to redefine how we look at the rain. From the picture on the left, and this is what a lot of our houses are still being built as right now. If you drive around your neighborhood, you can see that the houses are being built kind of on the top and the land slopes to the street. The reason for this was that we don't want water sitting against our house. You know, it gets into our basement, it causes issues with the foundation. But additionally, it also treats rainwater as something as a waste product and something that we need to get away and off of our property as quickly as possible. Um, and so it's really starting to view rain as a nuisance and something that we want, again, just to be moved off our property quickly. If you look at the picture here, the illustration, you can see that as water moves quickly across a sloped surface, it removes nutrients, it removes particles and deposits them into our waterways or into our streets rather. And as the rain falls on our paved surfaces, it collects all of that debris um, and trash and then it deposits it into our waterways. So instead, let's look at another way to look at rain, um, redefine the rain into a resource and it creates abundance in our house. And so the illustration here shows when you use rainwater harvesting strategies, how you can build this really healthy, um, vibrant landscape by utilizing that free resource. And I love this picture of this happy corgi. And so I wish all of you to be um, just like as happy as this corgi is when it rains. I have two small children, and of course I've been teaching them about rainwater harvesting. We have rain gardens at my house and rain barrels. And so now every single time it rains, they're like, mama, it's raining for your plants. And they're really excited about it. And so um, I hope that all of you can have that same joy for the rain. A rain garden is most simply a garden watered by the rain. You utilize a basin, which is basically a hole or a depression, and a berm, which is a buildup of soil that allows the water to be held in that basin. It's not a pond, it's just holding the water so that it has time to infiltrate into the ground. Um, in Colorado, um, what we experience typically with our rainstorms is quick flashes of rain. And so because they are so quick, we don't get usually those Seattle type rains where it just kind of drizzles all day long. So because we have those quick rains, having rain gardens to capture that water allows that water time to infiltrate because we have clay soils. And so the water typically just runs off. In addition to the basin and berm, we also need native plants. Native plants are a really critical component of rain gardens because they're adapted to our periods of dry and rain and, um, and they're able to thrive in those environments. 
And then finally, there's mulch. Mulch pr provides this sponge-like layer that holds that moisture in there and keeps it available for the plants. It also insulates the soil and helps to prevent weeds. Here are some principles of rainwater harvesting that rain gardens are a part of and utilizing in this strategy. So you want to start at the top of your watershed. Your watershed is your house. And so you want to start, usually it's your roof line is the top of your watershed. But if you live next to like a big hill, the top of that hill could also be the top of your watershed. Where does rain hit first? And then you want to start making adjustments to your landscape as close to the top as possible. The reason for that is you can move the water easier by starting at the top. Once it's down and pulled at the bottom, it's really hard to make it go back uphill. You have to you have to pump it out or something like that. But as the water is running downhill, use gravity to your advantage and you can redirect the flow of the water. So you wanna slow the flow, you wanna slow it down, spread it out, create multiple opportunities for water to infiltrate or sink it into the ground. And then start looking at all of your hard surfaces around your house. It could be your driveway, it could be your sidewalk, it could be pathways. And rain will fall and run off of those surfaces too. So how can you direct the rain to go into where you want it to go instead of going into the street? When we do this, when we keep all of the water that's being generated by our hard surfaces, like our roofs and our driveways and our sidewalks, and we keep it on our landscape, that is reducing the total amount of stormwater or water leaving your house, and that's protecting water quality. The reason it's protecting water quality is because if we don't have a bunch of water running into the streets, which have oil and trash and debris, then it doesn't have, it won't collect um, and run off into the, our streams. So by keeping our stormwater on our property, we're helping to protect water quality. As I was mentioning, you can collect so much more with rain, um, with passive harvesting. So just to show you, illustrate this in an example, the picture on the left is 55 gallons and the picture on the right is 71.25 gallons of water. And you can see in, from this picture that much more water could be held in this rain garden on the right and you're already at capacity or the maximum amount of water that you could contain in that 55 gallon um, rain barrel. So now you're probably wondering, how do you know that it's 71.25 gallons of water in that rain garden? Great question. I did it the hard way, which is by using your water meter. I turned off all the water in the house, and then I turned, I filled up my rain garden, and then looked at how much water I used. I recently found that there is an attachment on your hose that will tell you how many gallons you're using, and you don't have to go through all this trouble of your meter. So I would recommend doing that instead. <laughs> um, but it just showed, it just is an example to show how much more water you can harvest. I'll take a pause here to see if there are any questions. Again, you can put that in the Q&A um, and then um, I'll answer those for you or you can put them in a Q&A at a different time. Um, Jessica, I had a question. Um, yes. I don't know if there's any in the in the box yet. So, if we're talking about trying to redirect off driveways, I'm just thinking. I don't know. A lot of us have driveways, but that's sort of at our lowest point on our property. Well, I'm speaking for my own property. That's like my lowest point, and it's very flat. How? Yeah. Do you have ideas about how to redirect that water? Um, so at the top. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, what I always say, and we'll go into this in just a minute, but it's observe your watershed. Um, you know, when it rains, look at how the rain is going down your driveway. And a lot of times you'll see it kind of go off in a certain section. Okay. And that means, and it'll usually go off into the landscape in a certain way. And then you're like, oh, I can see how the water's flowing right here. I can use this water somehow. And now that I know it's running off in this one section, I can start, you know, using rocks or put, um, put a little depression there. Rain gardens don't have to be big. And you can just notice um, a lot of times, one of the ways you can see where water's running, even if you're not in a rainstorm, is you can see where grass is the tallest. 
Mm. If you have like a ton of weeds sprouting up right there, or you have really tall grass, then you're like, oh, that's getting more water. I can use that in some other way, you know, instead of looking at it as like, oh my gosh, it's a nuisance. I have to really weed eat that area a lot more often, or I'm getting fined by the city because my, my grass is too high or whatever. Um, you can say that's an area you can change. Okay. Gotcha. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Hmm. Just a comment in the in the box about thinking that a combination of both active and passive likely is a good approach to this. I know you're you're arguing that more water is is held and reserved if you're using the rain gardens, but I imagine having a little bit of a I don't know combination might be helpful as well for absolutely. I have rain barrels and rain gardens because it's actually, you know, it rains, even though it doesn't seem like it rains that much. We are, a lot of it's running off, you know, into our streets still. And so by using a combination of rain barrels and rain gardens, you can soak that water into the, into the landscape and then also collect water to use later after it's not raining on like your, um, food production gardens or your annual bed or your hanging plants or whatever it is. Right. So absolutely. 100%. Okay. Also, this isn't a question necessarily, but just thinking of sort of existing landscapes, I know my landscape's pretty well established at this point. Um, are there sort of some small ways we can, and maybe you're going to talk about this, but small ways we can in incorporate some of these ideas into existing um, more mature garden buds, that makes sense? Yes, so absolutely. One of the easiest things that you could do is read, make sure that your downspouts are going into your existing landscape because a lot of downspouts are being directed either, I've seen like a rock section between houses or they're going onto your um, hardscape, like your driveway or a sidewalk. Um, and so that is one like very easy thing that you can do um, and already start helping with infiltration and um, using that water immediately. And then there's some other ways that we'll talk about too. Okay, cool. Sounds good. Yeah. Okay. So let's talk about how to um, build the rain gardens. So this picture here is a picture of the rain garden that I built at my house. Um, you can see it's connected to my chicken coop and I'll tell you that whole process here in a moment. So here are the steps that we're going to go through. I just like to lay these out. Don't be intimidated. It's a lot of steps, but you know, I know that you're all avid gardeners and great things take time. You know, even when you are building your food production gardens, you know, it took a while to get the lumber that you needed and to get the plants and to build up the soil. And so it takes these steps. So there's more steps on the initial front end, but then once you get it in the ground, it's low maintenance. So stay with me, don't get intimidated and we'll walk through it together. So step number one, super, 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 super important. Please locate your utility lines. Um, call 811. You need to make sure you're not going to dig and hit a power line. That ruins everyone's day. Let's not hit any power lines. We don't want to hit the water lines either. That is going to create a big mess. Um, and then, of course, your gas line. So I just emphasize and emphasize how important it is to get your utility lines located. And what that means is they will call this number, they will come to your house and they will put lines on your lawn of where the utilities are so that you don't dig on them. <laughs> um, the thing to kind of know about this as well is that they will only locate, they will only draw the lines and they also put flags um, of where the utility line is to your meter. So it's not necessarily to your house unless the meter is on your house. So for example, my gas meter is on my house, but my water meter is at the edge, the front edge of my property. So I have water lines going from my meter at the front of my prop property into my house and 811 did not locate that for me. So you might have to get another company to make, to to tell you where your water line is. Um, the other thing they don't locate is existing irrigation. 
So you're going to need to know if you have existing irrigation, where that is on your property so you don't nick your irrigation line either. Um, and if you have small children, they really like removing all the flags so that you don't know where those lines are. So I had to keep re-putting my flags out because my kids, I have, like I said, small children and they kept moving them, but they thought it was very fun. So it's an activity for your safety and it's family fun at the same time. Okay, after you locate your meters or your, your lines, the next thing you need to do is choose a location. So what you can do for this is walk around your home and locate all of the downspouts on your house. These are all of your potential rain garden sites, super fun. I found out on my house that I had five different downspouts and five different opportunities for where to put rain gardens. Next in your location, you want to ask yourself when you're picking those spots and when you're going and looking at the different downspouts is, will the water drain away from my house? Is the slope going away from my house or towards my house? If it's going towards your house, you don't wanna put a rain garden there because when that rain garden fills up with water, it will need to overflow to somewhere else and you don't want that water sitting against your house. So that's a, an important consideration of where to put your rain garden. The next, I'm going to harp on this again, can I dig here? Utilities. <laughs> and then irrigation systems. If you have a septic system, you cannot put a rain garden on top of that. And you also need to be aware of a leach field. And that's connected if you have a septic system. If you don't know what a septic system or leach field are, then you probably don't have one. So that works out well. Next is, is it too close to my house? Generally, you know, they say 10 feet away from buildings. Um, and in this example right here, you know, it's right next to it. But then I will show you how you will move the water away from right next to the house and then direct it into your rain garden. So the rain gardens aren't against the house. They're a little ways away from it. Next is how much water will drain here. So we need to identify what the catchment area is. And again, that's just how much water is falling on this section of roof and how much, how many gallons of water will be flowing into my rain garden. That's an important calculation to determine how big your rain garden needs to be. And then uh, another question is, could I reduce the irrigation that I'm using? Could I use less water here if I were to install a rain garden? When you're choosing a location, think about, do you have any issues, any drainage drainage issues? Do you have any water ponding in areas that you don't want it to pond? So this is an example of my, as well, this is my driveway. As you can see, it's full of water. And this was before I did my landscape conversion. And this was the bottom of my watershed. So the orange, the top orange arrow is showing how my water slopes, or my water, how my uh, yard slopes. And so I needed to do things higher up in my watershed so I wouldn't have this massive amount of water just sitting on my driveway instead of being put to good use in my plants. So um, again, kind of in that changing the conversation about rainwater, you want to say, how can I turn this um, nuisance or this annoying issue that I'm having into benefits for my, my yard or my landscape? When you're looking at locations, you can also use other roofs. So I used my chicken coop. Um, and as you can see here, my chicken coop before on the left, I had about eight rose bushes and then I had weed fabric and then rock at my, at my house. And as you can see, it wasn't attractive. There was grass growing in there. We'll talk about weed bar barrier and um, what that doesn't do for you later, but it's just, it wasn't working. And I wanted to remove all of that to do something different. The other thing that I had going on right here is that our chicken coop did not have a, a gutter system on it. So all of the water would go, as you can see kind of how it sloped, it would go directly um, into my chicken coop. It would go underneath the door of the chicken coop there and then flood inside the chicken coop. And that was creating this kind of mucky environment that wasn't healthy for our chickens. And so that was a nuisance. And so I said, you know, I'd really love to use this water. 
in a beneficial way and change what we have going on here with these roses that need irrigation and change it to a rain garden. So on the right, you can see the conversion of installing that rain garden in that space afterwards. And I'll show you all the steps I took to get there. Okay, so now that you have determined where you're going to install your rain garden, you're like, okay, I have, I know which downspout I wanna use. This looks like a really good spot. Um, and I can see how this will, um, this will work well, you know, with my landscape plan and that sort of a thing. Next, you need to determine if the site is good for a rain garden. You need to do an infiltration test. So you want to dig out. Oh, the reason why you do an infiltration test is to make sure the water will soak into the ground at a reasonable amount of time. Um, it should take 12 hours or less for a rain garden to completely be dry after a rainstorm. So it's a very quick turnaround and infiltration process that may not sound like that much time, or that may sound like a lot of time rather, but it's very quick. Usually like my rain, my rain gardens um, are drained quicker than that. So to determine if you um, are able to do a rain garden there, the water has to drain. Um, and a lot of times we have a lot of clay. So if you have basically solid clay in your yard, your, your rain garden will not drain and that's an issue. So you dig a hole the size of a coffee can, at least 10 inches deep, and then you fill up the hole one time and let it drain. This is called a pre-wetting. And then you do a second fill of it. And I didn't have a measuring stick to use at the time. So I just used a tape measure. I made notches with a marker on a stick and every inch and every half inch it looks like and then I measured um, up 10 inches and then I filled it eight inches full of water. And then after four hours, measure the change in water level. That will be important in a um, just a second. So here is the test going on. Um, you can see I have my stick in the middle of my infiltration hole that I dug. And then you use one stick after four hours. Be sure to note what you started at. You make an additional mark to say, this is where I started. That's where I started my test, that eight inch mark from this test for me. And then after four hours, you see the change. And then you use this chart to determine um, if you're suitable for a rain garden. So if you have a change in water level that is between one and a half to one inches, then you can have a rain garden depth of three inches. If it's from one to one and a half inches, um, then it's a rain garden depth of six inches. And if it is more than 12 inches or more than two inches, sorry, more than two inches of change, it can be a rain garden depth of 12 inches. If the change in water is less than one half inch, that means it's probably solid clay and it's not suitable for a rain garden. So we'll use this chart later to to determine what size your rain garden can be and the depth part of your rain garden is really important. Okay, the next is checking your soils. So the infiltration test will give us more information about, is it feasible to put it here? And if you start getting, let me go back to this one. If you're on the top level of this graph, like the one and a half to one inch of change in four hours, then you know you probably have more clay in your yard. But it is good to see what your, the composition of your soil is to help you determine how you might need to amend your soil. So there's a couple different things that you can do to check the type of materials that are in your soil. So you can do a soils test using the jar method. So as you're digging your hole for infiltration, fill kind of a, a section. So you're kind of do, you wanna get the complete layers that you're digging in your infiltration hole and then put a sample into a mason jar like I did here and then pour, fill the rest of it away with water. And then you need to let it sit for probably a day. And then see, you'll see the, the stratification of the soil layers. It'll show you like the clay will go to the bottom and then you'll have a silt layer and then a sand layer. And so you'll be able to see exactly how much is in, the, in that section of your yard 
where you're looking to do your rain garden, which gives you more information. If you have a soil that has a lot of sand in it, then your water will infiltrate more quickly. If you have a lot of clay in it, then it will infiltrate very slowly. You can also send in a sample to CSU for $35. That is linked for you if you're interested. And just note, if you're doing multiple rain gardens in your yard, which is fantastic, if you are, you need to do an infiltration test and a soil test at each location because the infiltration rate and the soils may be different in different areas of your yard. If you don't wanna do the soils test or the jar test, there's another way you can see how much clay or silt or sand is in your yard. And this is the checking by feel test. So you take, um, just you grab a handful of soil, you put small amounts of water on it until you can make it into a ball. And then you try to move the soil through your fingers as pictured on the left hand picture here. If you can make a ribbon with it, as is on the right hand picture, the far right hand side, that means there's a ton of clay. <laughs> If it's the middle one where you can do a little bit of a ribbon, then it has the clay loam, which is a really good soil mix to have. And then if it's less than that, then it has more sand in it. So those are some different ways to see what type of soil are you working with. Your soils matter. It knows, it helps you to know what to expect from your rain garden, from your infiltration that you'll be getting. Um, and then it'll help you determine um, also just what you might need again to amend your soil with to have a really good functioning rain garden. Rain gardens will build up and improve your soil. And then based on what type of, um, what you determine about your soil type, that will inform what you need to add to it. Um, and just kind of making a, a note kind of on the amendments part, usually we have clay, like as we all know, um, and if there's clay, then I usually use a peat um, compost, a sheet peat compost mix um, to do amendments in, for, for rain gardens. So that's usually what, what type is needed to add a little bit more of those, um, like the loam into our soils and less clay to kind of help that clay, help it infiltrate better. Next, after you determine that your infiltration rate is going great in the area that you've picked for your rain garden, Next, you need to determine how big your rain garden can be. Now, there is a couple of different ways that you can do your rain garden. What's really cool about rain gardens is that once you determine how big your total size of your rain garden could be, you can make some adjustments to it. So I'll show you that an example here on the next slide. But first, you need to determine the square feet of your catchment area. Your catchment area is the roof line that is going to that downspout where the water is coming out that you're using for your rain garden. So the way, the easiest way to determine, you need to find the exact square footage of that section of roof going to that downspout. The easiest way to do that is to Google your address. Once you do that, click satellite view, zoom all the way into your house. You'll be able to notice your house. Then right click, a menu comes up and select the measure distance button. Once you do that, you will see these tiny white circles, as you can see pictured here, and you will need to, um, let me see if I can get my pen here, my laser pointer. Okay, so here are the different pen um, circles. So you will put the circle down, you will click, and then you will drag, and then you will click at each corner of this roof line, okay? So the, then you have four squares. You need to bring it all the way back and cross over and do one final click. When you do that, you will see that there is a box that comes up as pictured here, but it's a little hard to see, that before you cross over the, the first mark you made, it'll just say how many feet are on your roof line, once you cross it over and make it a square, it'll tell you the square feet, okay? So you have to make clicks on each of the corners of your roof line and then cross it over. Keep an eye on this box that appears here at the bottom and look for where it has here total area and the square feet. 
Once you have the square feet in there, then you use that into this calculation, which is the size of the rain garden calculation. So you plug in the catchment area and square feet, which in the example below, or the example from this picture is 710 square feet. And then you multiply that by the average rainfall event, not the annual rainfall, the average rainfall event in inches, which our average rainfall event is half an inch, and then divided by the rain garden depth, which you determined in the earlier slide when we were doing our infiltration test and you saw that chart. So you basically just plug in these numbers. And if you had the maximum amount of, um, of change of water depth, so for example, if it was over two inches, then you could have a 12 inch depth of your rain garden, but you could also have a shorter depth or a, a shallower depth rather. So you could change it. So to illustrate this, if you, in this example, if you had 710 square feet, multiply that by half an inch and then divide that by 12 inches for our rain garden depth, you would get 29 square feet. So you could do, it's, I know that five times six is not 29, <laughs> but it's just to give you an example of, you could do a, approximately a five by six layout. If you're like, you know, I really like to have kind of a, a skinnier layout because of, I want this to be longer right under my, my window. You know, you can mess with the depth and length of your rain garden to fit your yard. So if instead you're like, no, I'd really rather it be six inches, let me come over here again, six inches. So then you multiply the 710 square feet by your average rainfall event of 0.5 inches divided by six inches. And then you get 59 square feet. You could do a seven by eight or a 12 by five, both approximately of course. If you have more than one downspout going to the location where you're putting your rain garden, you have to add in the additional catchment area to the first number up here. And I am going to show you an example of pictures of that um, later on. I have a cool example. Okay, now that we know the depth of and size that our rain garden needs to be. You've already picked out the perfect spot. You know it's not over anything with utilities. Here is all of the materials that you will need. Um, I put compost in here and that's your soil amendments of what you need to add in for your soil. Um, and then for the, when you're trying to determine how big your rain garden is or where you're going to put it, it's helpful to have some way of designating that spot. So you can use some yard spray paint, chalk, or even string or anything else to just show where your outline of your rain garden will be. Then you need to prep your site. It depends what's on your site. In my case, it was rock. So I needed to move all of the rock remove the weed fabric, but in your case, it could be moving sod. You need to, might need to cut an area of your lawn out to install your rain garden. Um, so that really depends on what particular your situation is. I've installed rain gardens that have been just on like weeds. There's like nothing there. There's rock, there's lawn. So there's a multiple different um, materials that you might be interacting with. If you have lawn. Um, Resource Central, I hope that Phoebe or someone from Resource Central could put in their resources here for turf removal. They have a turf removal program. Um, if you are not in an area that works with Resource Central for turf removal, <laughs> um, there might be your municipality um, might have other turf removal options. So in Fort Collins, we have a program called ZIP and they have a turf removal contractor list. You could get a sod cutter rental from Home Depot or Lowe's or wherever. 
And then you could potentially um, list your sod on Nextdoor or Facebook for pickup um, or use it you know, for compost or something like that. There is a lasagna method that you could do to remove your turf, um, which we could get into later of what all that is included. There's a formula for how to remove or kill off um, turf to be able to do different plantings. So there's a multiple options for that um, so that you can um, plant something else, in this case, a rain garden. And I did see one of the questions come in of borrowing my children to help with the rain garden. <laughs> they love doing rain gardens and you'll see more pictures of my children throughout. But yes, they really love doing them and kids, of course, love to be involved in gardening. Okay, so next you're digging to the infill, you start digging, we're excited, we're ready to dig. Um, so dig to the calculated infiltration depth that you have determined. Um, be sure to slope the sides and make sure the bottom of the rain garden is flat, flat. So the reason for this is having it flat on the bottom. And this picture, it doesn't look like it's flat on the bottom, but it is. So you want to have it flat on the bottom so that water can fill up your rain garden at an equal rate. You want it to kind of fill up like a bathtub. You're making a bathtub, essentially, um, with kind of more of a sloped area. So the sloped area, it can be, it can be more, um, you know, a steeper slope or a more flat slope. That's really up to you, um, but a lot of rain gardens look like um, a kidney bean. There's a lot of those examples of rain gardens. The rain gardens I'm going to show you do kind of have that pattern, but you can have rain gardens that look all sorts of different ways. There might be ways to integrate it into with additional areas. So for example, when I was doing this, um, my calculations for my um, chicken coop here, what I determined, I wanted to use this entire area for a rain garden. But you know what? This little chicken house did not deliver enough water for this entire area. So what I did instead was I made this section my rain garden and this upper section, this upper section is on a slope. And so water can theoretically drain down this way. And so I created a little depression here and then did xeric plantings in this upper section. So I added my rain garden, which will get water from the chicken coop. And then I added in this xeric section here. Now you may be wondering about this, um, my mind is blanking. What is this called? Irrigation line right here. So that was existing and it was really difficult and it's connected to other things. So I just capped it off and left it in there. You don't need to install irrigation in rain gardens because that's, you're wanting to have them watered by the rain. And then once you're, we're looking at how your rain garden is functioning, observe where the water flows. And we'll be looking at um, some examples of that here coming up. When you're doing your soil prep, or you're prepping, prepping your site, you wanna create that basin, which is that depression. And then you wanna create the berm, which is the buildup of soil to keep the water in the basin and allow it to infiltrate. When you're building this, you also need to look, okay, when the rain garden is full, where is the water going to exit it? Where is that overflow point? It's also called a spillway. So you need to be sure to build up your berm high enough to keep the water in and then to create the spillway so that when it's full, you can direct where that water will go next. And that is a really important point. Uh, you're not creating any issues with water going where you don't want it to go. Next is when you are bringing water to a point and bringing it into um, an area where you're just directing water to enter into your rain garden in one area. You need to put some cobble so that it doesn't create erosion. Erosion is where the water makes its own trench um, and then it, then it creates its own hole essentially. So this is one of the rain gardens I helped to install. This is called a downspout extender. And underneath where that is, we created this um, 
these cobbles as entryway for the water so the water can spread out evenly and the soil underneath it is protected and doesn't create this hole where the water is digging in if it didn't have any of this protection. So when the water comes in, it kind of goes along the bottom of this rain garden like so and then fills up like a bathtub. Next, after you have your rain garden dug, then this is when you wanna do your soil prep if needed. Um, native plants need native soils. What you don't wanna do is to remove the native soil and put in like potting soil. Um, that's absolutely not what we, what we want to do. We just want to add maybe a little bit of compost um, to make that infiltration rate a little bit better, but we don't want to remove all of the native soil and completely replace it. Um, again, native plants need native soils. Then you want to mix it eight to 12 inches into that soil to get a good um, mixture. Okay, briefly on weed barrier. Um, weed barrier sounds like a great idea. We definitely don't want rain barrier, uh, weed barrier, weed barrier in rain gardens for a lot of reasons. But as you can see here, I had weed barrier at my house. Like I said, landscaping was installed with, with weed barrier. So from the picture on the left, the far left, that has weed barrier and then rock over it. Weeds grow over weed barrier. I know it sounds like that shouldn't happen but it does. Weed seeds blow like soil blows on top. We've had this crazy amount of wind. The wind blows soil on top of the rocks, on top of the weed barrier, and then uh, weed seeds get into that soil and they grow. So it's not stopping weeds anyway. Um, at my house, I had weed barrier going right up to a tree. So it was um, choking the tree essentially is what it was doing. And it also created this mound, you know, as my tree grew up, it mounded the roots. And so the water was going right over the, the tree and not doing any infiltration and my tree had gotten sick. So what I did was I cut away all of the weed barrier and the rock created, excuse me, a basin and then filled it in with mulch. So you may be wondering, if you're making all these holes everywhere in your lawn, you know, or your yard, what does that look like? You're like, I don't really want, Jessica, that sounds nice, but I don't really want a bunch of holes in my yard. So they don't look like that. I just wanted to show here that you can't even see it. Um, there is a depression right here, but it's filled in with mulch and you can't see it. It does not look like a giant hole in your landscaping. Okay. Next, we get water to your garden. There's a number of ways that you can do that. Um, like I said, it's the rain gardens aren't directly up against a house. So there are, you have to move the water from your downspout to your rain garden. So one of the things that you can do is, you know, have your gutter and downspout as in the first picture on the left, you can get a downspout extender. These are pretty straightforward easy to install um, and convenient to move your water from your downspout to the location that you want it to go. You can get really fancy and do an underground pipe with an outlet. So that would take some like PVC. You could do, um, you connect the PVC to your downspout, then you direct the water, it's all gravity flow. So it's going downhill. And then you have like this little pop-up valve, which is pretty cool that when it, when there's water coming out, the valve pops up, it lets the water in. And then when there's no more water flowing, it closes so that you can't get critters grow, um, walking or hanging out in that outlet pipe. So that's another way that you could do it. If, for example, you would like your rain garden to be at the front of your property, but your, that would be a long way to have a downspout extender and you don't want to have people trip over it or whatever you could do this underground pipe and outlet. And then the last example is doing a, like a cobble swale. This is actually at the city of Fort Collins municipal building. And it was just an example, but you can create a rock path that will go from your downspout to your rain garden. So you're kind of looking to have a hard packed 
path on a slope because you're not really looking to have the water infiltrate into your cobble area, but it could, but you're trying to get most of the water going into your rain garden. So that's another way if you don't want to have a downspout extender, you know, going a long ways from your downspout to your rain garden, you could also make it look like a dry riverbed with cobbles going down to your rain garden as well. I'll take a pause here. I know we covered a lot of material. Just want to take a moment um, if there are any questions. Anyone has questions, feel free to drop them in the Q&A section. This is a lot, I'm excited. I'm like already measuring my roof. <laughs> oh, great. Um, I know that. I know that it's a lot and and for me I'm a I'm a visual learner yeah. and so I like seeing examples. You're like, okay, I can't really see in my mind what that would look like. So I have a lot of pictures coming up to illustrate what these steps look like and then what a rain garden looks like. Um, right. because pictures really really help me. So Yeah, 100%. Um we have a question, how careful do you need to be around trees? So that's actually later on in the presentation, I have a comment about go working around tree roots. So if you have your infiltration depth of like 12 inches, but you, you encounter tree roots, you obviously don't want to like cut the tree roots, just be careful around them and make the area as flat as possible. You might have to adjust where you're putting your rain garden based on tree roots because you can't, that, that's um, preventing you from going deeper. You just want to be careful if you nick the tree roots then they can get you know um, diseases and that sort of a thing and so i would say be more careful around younger trees and mm -hmm. especially because they tend to be fragile um and then you can you know i'm not going to say be less careful around older trees but um but most careful around younger trees um what else am i going to say about that Oh, is that if you expose tree roots during your rain garden, they're like kind of a part of it, you can cover tree roots with mulch and that's okay. Um, and actually they, they do well when you cover them with mulch. So don't worry too much about that. But again, since you need to have a bottom that's flat of your rain garden, you'll okay. need to probably have an area a little bit farther away from the tree roots so that you can make it flat. Okay, perfect, that makes sense. Yeah. We had another question about <clears throat> having a rain garden without a downspout. Okay, yes, you totally can. So, but you have to have a source of water. <clears throat> um, so trying to decide, I have so much information on this that I'm trying to decide how much to tell you. Sure. <laughs> um, if, you have a, if you have a specific, if this person has a specific case, um, Paula, are you from the neighborhood with, it's like a, it's an area that goes into the neighborhood you're looking to refurbish. I'm just curious with working with Mary. Anyway, um, so you need to have a source of water. So a lot of times you need to have a way for water, well, all the time you need to have a water, a way for water to get into your rain garden. If it is not connected to a downspout, but it's next to a street, there is like a curb cut that you could do. You need to get permission probably from the city to do that. Um, but there are ways to get, to use water that are coming in from different directions. So if you have water that's running off from a sidewalk, you can direct that to a rain garden. Um, if it's coming off from a street, you can move that water. So there are multiple different ways. It's just when we're talking about residential properties, the easiest way to install a rain garden is next to a downspout since you already have those and water's already being directed there. Um, if you have specific questions that you want to ask me um, about like your, your situation, then we can um, communicate via email or I could stay on after this if you want to give me some examples. Um. These are a little bit more specific to a certain area, but a couple of them. I think I might skip over these. I'm, I'm assuming if you're talking about, um, if you're built into a slope, um, say this is like the house, are you, you're still always wanting to create a level bottom, right? 
it doesn't need to be like, you don't actually want it to be a basin, right? So you don't need to build it, like dig into your slope. You just need to sort of step it out. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. You definitely want like a terrace. You want yeah. to terrace it so right. that the water can come down, infiltrate on a flat area and then run off down the slope. So you could do a series of rain gardens and actually I have an example of that to show oh, you cool. <laughs> <laughs> um, of how you of like a mini example of how that would look. Perfect. That sounds awesome. Uh, cool. I think we can go ahead and, and move on. And I have a couple questions, but I think you're going to get to it. It's about plants. Okay. So. Oh yeah. 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 Okay. So let's look at some pictures. So this is an example of a rain garden that we installed with Groundwork Denver. They were an amazing partner. Um, and so I'll show you what that looks like. One of the things that I just love about landscape transformations is like the satisfaction of starting with something. And then at the end, you're like, look what I did. It looks amazing. You know, so this is when we started the day. Um, excuse me. We started the day. We determined that the rain garden would be going about right here. And then we started digging. Now you can see that the berm is starting to be built here. We're um, moving the soil from the bottom. We're creating that we dug down to the infiltration depth that we had determined. And then we're starting to create that level bottom here. And then you can see it already kind of taking shape here. We're creating that berm. It looks like a lot of soil right now, and I'll show you what happens with it next. Okay, so we started to pack it down. So you can see right here, you need to have a berm, but then you need to pack it down by stepping on it. There's a couple of different ways that you can do that. I tend to just like jump like a rabbit. I have kids, I'm just say bunny, and it's almost Easter. <laughs> so anyway, I tend to just kind of like hop along my, um, my rain garden berms to, to pack them down. You can also get um, a tool that is called, what is that called? It's, it looks like it's a flat, it's flat on the bottom and it has a, a um, stick on it. Oh my gosh, you guys, I'm sorry. Um, it has a handle, it has a handle and then like a flat thing. And so then you just, you flatten it. You just kind of like do this along it, which is basically like you jumping. So if you already have that tool, that's a flattener, essentially, that is, has a name that I can't think of. Um, and then you can use that tool or you can just use your own kind of body weight to tamp. It's called a tamper. You tamp it down. I knew that my brain would engage at some point. Um, so you can use that, or you can just, um, like I said, step on it. And it's easier if, the soil is a little bit damp um, or has more moisture content in it, then it will tamp down better than um, if it's dry. So just note if it's, if it's kind of crumbling around, then you would need to um, have it just be a little bit more wet. But if it's really wet, then it'll just, it'll just be mud and it'll stick to your shoes. So there's just a healthy balance of moisture level in the soil to be able to um, compress it for your berm area. And then you need to do your plant layouts. So I always, I'll show you some examples of how to do a planting layout, but here you can see the bottom is flat and then it'll fill up like a bathtub along these sides. When we're talking about plants here in a moment, different plants need to be planted at different sections of the rain garden. The bottom of the rain garden will receive the most water. So the plants that you plant at the bottom have to be able to accept the most water. So the plants that we're talking about for that have high plasticity. And so they can have periods of inundation of water and dryness. The plants at the next phase up will need less water than the plants at the bottom. And then the plants at the top of the berm are all of your xeric plants that need the least amount of water. Um, in this particular case, you will also find, um, or I will tell you, this will happen. If you do the planting of your rain garden in May, June, July, you will have better success because um, with the ease of digging, because the soils are still retaining some of that moisture from our rainier months, 
I helped to plant this in September when the ground was extremely hard. So it was very difficult to, um, to dig this rain garden. And so we even had to do, we had to water the sections where the plants were going because it was so dry. You will not need to do that if you're planting during one of the wetter months that I was mentioning. But you can see how the plants are starting to be installed and then watering them in. The protection right here the, for the stones is already installed. Um, and then kind of doing the last uh, minute edits here or changes, adjustments to the rain garden. After the rain garden is installed, I always test it. And in my next example, I'll show you how I test it. And I test it before the mulch is put down because then you can see the water flowing in. Isn't it beautiful? Look how beautiful this rain garden is. Okay, then afterwards you put the mulch on. So here's the example of the finished rain garden. Most of the time, the bottom plants that you will put in there will be grasses. I will tell you my most favorite grasses to put in here um, that are just beautiful. So just so you know, mostly grasses go at the bottom. <clears throat> and then before you finish, you need to put mulch in and I'll be talking about mulch after these examples. Okay, here's the second site. And we're showing that it's going to be installed right here. So I love this teaching example so much. So when I first came to this site, what I was just mentioning to Phoebe, you might notice right here. What does this look like right there? Look, all of this grass has grown up a ton. It's way higher than this grass right here, which tells us that there's wa more water coming from somewhere. It is coming from the neighbor's downspout. So here's the neighbor's downspout. It's running right to where we're putting the rain garden. And as you can see over here, they're having a ton of erosion right here. So eventually water is going to cut underneath this driveway and this driveway will collapse. So because we're installing this rain garden for the neighbor over here, we're actually, we made a way to help this neighbor too, which was really cool. So my son is in this one too. Uh, he loves installing rain gardens. So each rain garden site is unique and there's a lot of cool opportunities with each one. So for this one, we need to add in some stability and brick and bring up the level of the soil to really help prevent further erosion and degradation of this driveway of the neighbor. So we added in this brick to do that. But you can see that we're starting to remove the soil, starting to have that flat area at the bottom. Next, there is the, we flatten the bottom completely. We put this erosion control up here, did the berm over here. Now, um, I love talking about mistakes because um, they just help us learn. And I've made so many, and I can now tell all of you, don't do this. <laughs> so initially we tried um, to add in this cobble right here as another way to help with some of the erosion. And then we tested it. It's important to test it and to see if what you put in there works. So we ran water from the area where the neighbor's water would be coming in and the cobble failed miserably did not work. Um, it was creating these uh, erosion already, even with that tiny bit of, of water we were using. And so we knew immediately that the cobbles were too small and they were not gonna function and support that, that kind of steeper slope on that side like we wanted it to. So we ended up changing that design um, on the, you know, while we were there, which really helped that we tested it. So you can see here that we have some more of these beautiful grasses on our bottom level. And then as we went up, we have um, flowers that are more and more xeric or need less water. Okay, so now we're at the testing section. Look how beautiful that rain garden is. I get excited every time I see a rain garden come together. So how you test it is you put a hose and you put water in the top of your downspout where the water is going into your rain garden. We had another downspout extender on this one. And then you see the cobble here at the bottom to 
provide that protection for the water coming in. So we, had, we hadn't made the change yet with this um, cobble, but you can see here, when, what I like to do when the water is coming in is I can see how the water's flowing and it's like so interesting. And then I can see if there's any high points in the soil. And I just kind of, it's like you're doing rain garden art. You know, you're, you're um, flattening it out and, and making it the best so the bathtub fills up at equally at the same time. But you can see where the bottom level of the rain garden is um, because it's all full of water. And then, then finally, here it is, we made changes to what that, that material was on this side. We ended up using some like flagstone type pieces and then testing it again. As you can see, we poured water to test how that was going to come in from that side view as well. And then here, finally, we, of course, it needs to have mulch. And so that's the final product mulched. <clears throat> when I talk about plants, and then I'll talk about mulch after that. So I know you're all dying to know what native plants you should use in your garden. This is a picture of chocolate flower. Chocolate flower is so cool. It has a cascading effect like it's shown here and it smells like Hershey's chocolate. I'm not joking, it smells like Hershey's chocolate. I thought my kids were going to try to eat my flowers. They haven't yet, but I think it's still a possibility. So that's a really cool fragrant flower to use. I'll show you some more examples here. Okay, plant sales. Where do you get your plants? So I know that not everyone is um, joining us today from Boulder. So I wanted to offer a couple of different suggestions in different areas. Always check with your local nurseries, um, but these are areas that I are different providers that I know have native plants as well. In Fort Collins, the gardens on Spring Creek has one annual plant sale. The High Plains Environmental Center is a focused almost exclusively on natives and they have an online plant sale um, that will be kicking off, I think sometime in April. And then Harlequin Gardens is also has a lot of natives and they are based in Boulder. Um, so those are all different places that you can go for native plants. If you're using your local nursery and you have your plant palette already picked out, what I have done in the past is just call around to see who has them because um, sometimes they have them and sometimes they don't. And so instead of, or you can drive around and see who has what, but so I found the best thing that I did um, was just to call ahead. Okay, so as I was mentioning, there are these tiers to your rain garden. Your topmost tier is your xeric or the plants that need the least amount of water. The next tier down needs a little bit more water and the bottom tier has to have the most plasticity or ability to have an inundation of water and less water. So we'll start at the top tier. Um, you can also use some shrubs right here. Um, this list is from Dr. Jennifer Busolo who is fantastic. Um, and so that is just one to give her credit for creating this list of plants. So you can include some um, shrubs or some plants that have food on them as an additional component of your rain garden. Um, pictured here is the golden current. I have a golden current at my house. It's not connected to my rain garden, but they are, um, the golden currants are really delicious and they're a native plant and they need not very much water. So these are some options here. These are larger plants and the Rocky Mountain maple is actually a tree or it's, it's classified as a shrub here, but it is a tree, it's large. Um, so just so you know, these are some things that you can look for for the top tier shrubs. And then perennials. So I have used almost all of these perennials in my rain gardens and I'm obsessed. Hyssop is just fantastic. Um, hyssop is um, also called hummingbird mint. And after I did my landscape transition, I put hyssop in and I had hummingbirds in my garden for the very first time. So big advocate of hyssop. It smells so good. It's a late blooming flower. So it's adding that like late season um, smell and they have this like really beautiful smell to them as well. The leaves and the flowers because it's like a mint. 
Um, so highly recommend. Pinstamins of pretty much any variety, um, I also love. And then wine cups, I'll show you some pictures of wine cups, but wine cups are really cool. They are a um, ground cover and they have these little pink flowers on them and they just kind of do their thing. It is great. And then Harabelle's are one of the few that can be done in partial shade. And I'm from Texas. And so they remind me of bluebells or blue bonnets rather. And so I think that they're, they do, they look like tiny little bells and um, they're really, really cute. So I, I like a lot of these, all of the ones that I have folded, I have used. Top tier grasses. So you'll notice that the grasses I'm talking about are top tier and you can use them in other levels too. So the, um, the blue grama, the buffalo grass, Indian rice grass, and little blue stem. I've used the blue grama and little blue stem. I have, um, and I really liked them both. So um, lots of options with cool grasses. Next, we have middle tier shrubs. You'll notice that some of these are the same. So I'll skip through those. And then middle tier perennials, these need a little bit more water. I have used bee balm. Bee balm is super fun. They kind of like, um, I actually have a picture in the back. You kind of can't see, but that's a picture of bee balm right there. Uh, the bees seriously do love bee balm. There are different colors of bee balm. The kind that I have, I think the native one is pink, purple, but I've also seen red. And then um, Black Eyed Susans are also really neat, as are these others. I have, I've used yarrow as well, um, which is this, it's a taller perennial and um, really just grows beautifully. And then middle tier grasses, like I mentioned, these are the same since they have that plasticity, they can either have water or they can also be syrup. Your bottom tier shrubs, a lot of these are the same. This pictured here is boulder raspberry. That beautiful white flower is just gorgeous. And then bottom tier perennials. These are some perennials that you can use. Um, like I said, I prefer to use grasses for the bottom tier, but these are options for you as well. And then the bottom tier grasses, like I mentioned already, the blue grama and then the little blue stem. Okay. Designing your rain garden. Um, so there's a lot of different ways that you can do your design. Um, and I like to do my layout and put it on a grid paper. I just used like a chart, like kind of an Excel. And then you have to look up all of the mature plant sizes and put them into your chart so that you know when you initially plant everything, it'll look way too spread apart. And then as they grow in, then of course um, it will fill in as it needs to fill in. When you're creating your chart, it's easiest to use a one by one box so that one square on your chart is one square foot. That's not what I did on this chart, but this was just a layout to show you. My next example, I used the one-to-one -one and it was much easier. So do one-to-one -one so that you know um, what your measurements need to be when you add in your mature plant sizes. One of the best things to do with designing um, plant layouts is to group the same plants together. Usually you do them in odd numbers, so three or five. Um, you don't have to, it's just kind of one of the design um, principles that usually looks well, that looks good together. Um, group the same plants together, you know, because of that visual appeal, but also because it creates habitat and if the bees are going to these plants, you know, they're small and it's easier for the bee to just go to many flowers in one area than having to go from one plant to another plant to another plant that are spread out through the garden. So you're making it easier for pollinators if you group the plants together. So here is a one by one um, square foot box. And this is just another illustration of what your design could look like. When you're doing your designs and you're um, looking at the plant sizes, if you have a plant, if you have a garden rather, <clears throat> that is 
in the center, if it's a circle and it's in the center, like in the middle of the yard, you might wanna put your tallest plants in the middle. If you have a garden that's against your house, you'll wanna put the plants, the tallest plants facing your house and the smallest plants at the front. So whatever, whatever angle you're looking at your garden, you want the smallest plants to be first and then the tallest plants. Um, and so that's how you can kind of do your mixtures. There's also plant designs where you have a couple of tall plants and then smaller plants, and then you have a tall plant again. So there's a lot of different ways to do it. There's no like perfect way. These are just some examples of as you're discovering how you want to do your design, some ideas to help you get started. So I wanted to show you, you know, I think it's, it's so hard to know when you have plants um, and, you and you plant them, and, but they don't have flowers on them and you have an image in your mind of what that's gonna look like, but it's hard when you first plant them to really know if your vision is coming together. So um, here's an example of this top picture here is when I did my installation. Now, this isn't my rain garden. I also, this is my xeric planting section, but just as an example. So here's when I planted it and here's last year. Makes me so excited for spring, for all my flowers to come up again, you know? But um, everything just grew in so beautifully. Um, so as you're doing your design, think about what colors do you want? What kind of, what makes you happy to be outside? What excites you? What makes you want, you know, your plants to grow up again and just to sit out there and be? What, what smells do you want to be next to? Um, what kind of environment are you trying to have? So those are the things that I just want to um, advise for you to keep in mind again, as you're doing your planting. So in this picture here, let me go back. So this design that I showed you here is this design um, in real life. So just to show how that came together. I planted my tallest plants at the back, the pinstamens are the tallest, and then I planted my shortest plants at the, at the bottom. These ones over here are hard to see, but they're uh, called prairie smoke, which um, look that up, it's really cool. It's, um, and it blooms first in my garden um, every year. And they have these tiny little um, pink flowers on them that then like explode into a poof. And then they're really soft. And they remind me of Dr. Seuss plants. Um, when you look it up, you'll know what I talk, what I'm talking about. But they are just really, really cool looking plants. And then they have this visual interest because they end in this poof and it kind of spreads out as it dries into a seed. And so it's really neat. Um, so just to put that out there for cool plants. Okay, so here's the rain garden. Wanted to show you my rain garden layout. Um, here are the plants that I used. I also included how tall they are um, at um, their full grown heights. Something to note with native plants is that you need three years to really get them to be kind of their, their fullest. Um, so when you first initial, when you first plant them, um, you need to do your establishment watering. You need to do your establishment watering for three years with the first year being the most water, the second year less water and the third year the least, of course. So if you're interested in um, just kind of seeing what those look like, I just laid those out for you so you can see which ones I used um, and which ones have worked well. And, um, and then as you're considering plants to use, Think about what kind of pollinators you want to attract and wildlife. Having plants um, that bloom at different times of year, what do you want to like smell and see? Um, take into account the shape of your rain garden, maybe some areas of your lawn that you want to, or your yard that you want to accentuate, or plants can be used to block things that you don't want to accentuate. So those are all different options. And then pictured here on the far right is a hyssop in blue. So I told you I would show you the process of my rain garden being planted. Um, so here is the before on the far left and then planting day, of course, you know that a lot went into it before planting day happened, but planting day on May 17th. And then um, when I planted it, I always, like to show the planted picture. 
because most people are like, whoa, that is a lot of mulch. That's too much mulch. <laughs> but I also like to show the bottom right picture is that is the first growing season. And you can, it's already really filling in beautifully. And the mulch is um, even less visible now because my plants are really, really growing now. So um, from planted to June to September, there's a lot of growth in the rain garden. Okay, next, the last step is, um, or the next to last step is adding mulch. You want to use at least a three inch depth of mulch. The best kind of mulch to use is shredded because if you're imagining your, your rain garden filling up with water, then mulch floats. So if you get shredded mulch, it holds together better and will have a less tendency to leave your rain garden when your rain garden overflows. Chipped mulch is lighter than shredded mulch and it has a tendency to float more, but chipped mulch you can usually get for free. I'm a huge advocate of free. A lot of municipalities will offer free mulch and tree companies. So tree companies, when they remove trees, they have to pay to dump their mulch or their chipped mulch um, at a facility. And so a lot of times tree companies will deliver mulch to your house by the truckload. So that might be another really good avenue. If you want to try the chipped, the free chipped mulch first, that's great. And then if you're finding that it's leaving your um, rain garden a lot and you're having to constantly like move it back in your rain garden, then you can try the shredded mulch, which you'll have to pay for. And then um, test your water. So um, we already talked about how you do your tests of it, but then you just really want to be able to see that water flow, how it's going into your rain garden. Um, are there any areas that you didn't think about? Um, and then of course, it's just fun to see the water going into your rain garden. And then again, there's what that looks like. Maintaining your garden. Um, so as I mentioned, you need to do, um, establishment watering. So you can use a rain barrel. We talked about at the very beginning of the class today, um, how you can use active and passive systems together. So you can use your rain barrel to do your establishment watering for your um, rain gardens. You want to do um, deep watering, maybe about once per week versus like shallow watering every day. But when you first plant your plants, you want to water them probably every other day. There should be a maintenance guide, you know, with the plants that you get if you get them. Well, I was thinking about Resource Central because they give you a maintenance guide. Um, but you want to start watering your plants probably every other day um, when you first um, plant them. And then after the first couple of weeks, then you can um, kind of start doing two days in between and then depending on how hot it is. After the rain gardens are established, they will only need supplemental water during very dry spells. So once they're established, they will be good to just use the rain, the rainfall that they receive from the downspout. And again, only if it's really, really dry, will they need that supplemental watering. Rain gardens are also meant to clean. So when the water, when rain falls from the sky, it's clean, unless you're going through pollution, then that's a little bit of a different story. But if it goes, once it hits your roof, then it's already collecting debris and dust and um, pollen and all sorts of things. So the water has gotten dirty. But once it goes into your rain garden, the pollutants that are in that water get filtered out through the soil profile. And then when it goes into the the groundwater, it's clean again. So your rain gardens are cleaning out your water. So right here, when I say sediment, so they will collect different dust and debris. If you see that it's starting to collect a lot on top of your mulch, you can just kind of remove that top layer of mulch and then replace it. You will need to weed. All gardens need weeding. We know this. Um, so as the gardens are being established, you'll need to do more weeding. As the flowers grow up and start to shade that soil, you'll have less weeds and um, the mulch will help 
um, to also prevent some of the weeds too, but there will be weeds in your rain garden. And as the flowers are getting established, you just wanna provide that space for the flowers to actually take off instead of, um, and the weeds not out competing them. So some challenges, tree roots, like you brought up earlier, um, then you can't make your garden at, in that, maybe that location that you wanted to make it in or as deep as you wanted to make it. For my the bed that I put here, which is Zeric, I made it shallow because the roots are um, pretty close to the surface from this apple tree. Weeds were very frustrating. I learned about weeds and how long they can live in the soil. And so whenever you do any soil disturbance, um, you're going to have weeds pop up literally, pun intended, um, and you just have to deal with it. I have bindweed in my yard, bindweed. Um, so that's just something frustrating that, you know, I have to deal with in my yard. And then, as I mentioned already, hard ground. If you do install your, your rain garden in this, um, like, September, August, September months, what you can do to make it easier is you can, um, what, like, wet, like, that area before you dig the next day, just put um, some water on it and then it'll be easier to dig. Um, I know we're getting close to the end and I want to um, leave time for questions, but I have a quick, um, just showing you what this yard transition looked like at my house. Um, I do have, it isn't the rain garden that I have, but I'll show you just how that, how that happened. So I was looking at some of the issues that I had in my yard. Um, right here, we had just poor soils and then a slope that went down. The picture I showed you earlier of my flooded driveway was down here. I had very low plant diversity, mostly weeds. Um, so it was just, I wanted to find ways to use some um, rainwater harvesting here. So here I used, um, I created basins around my trees to try to use some of that water that was coming off of the slope. And my apologies for these slides not being um, translated. So I will work on that for when I send these slides out. Um, so I was looking at, you know, where is the water coming from? How can I use it to my advantage and get more water to the trees and the plants that I will be putting in here? And then I just did multiple basins and you can connect basins by a path. So each basin has a, um, it's a depression and then each berm is like an, um, it's a raised area. And so you can make a path based off of the raised areas that connect the basins, super cool. Um, so they can work together to create that. So that's what I did with mine. And then we had to cut down a tree that was dying. And so we used um, these lily pads that were slices of the tree to make our path. Um, so I wanted to show you this because I was talking about weed fabric and how you shouldn't use it. I tried to figure out a way to not use weed fabric on my path and could not figure out a way. I called so many people to say, I don't wanna use weed fabric, what should I do? And they basically said for a path, you've got to use weed fabric. So um, weed fabric was only underneath my path. And so I put this breeze on there. It's a very fine rock component to go in between all of these um, lily pads. And then I used this, um, it's flagstone, it's called strip stone. It's long skinny pieces of flagstone. And then I put them together because they have gaps. So now I was trying to think of, this is a hard surface. So when water flows across it, I angled my pathway so that water would go into my areas that had my basins. Then um, this was the part I was going to talk about when Phoebe was talking about that question earlier of connecting um, into a hillside different um, depressions. So right here, I was going to put a bench. So I wanted to show that I, this was the bench area. I realized that since this was going to have runoff going directly to my bench, that it was going to put a lot of soil right underneath the bench. So I created this reverse berm. So usually you want your berm to keep the water in, right? Well, I created this reverse berm so that water would go around 
and go where I wanted it to go, direct it into these mini rain gardens right here, these mini depressions, and um, instead of flooding out the area that I was going to be sitting. So you might be thinking, ooh, I'm not, that doesn't look good. So I wanna show you what it ended up looking like. And you can't even tell that these are depressions. So these have one plant each in them. The bottom ones have the grass that is um, Blonde Ambition. And this has um, lavender and the top one is a hyssop. So I wanted for that section, I wanted it to be, have a lot of smells. I wanted hummingbirds to be able to like, I wanted to sit on this and have hummingbirds around and pollinators. And so I was putting thought into what I wanted that to look like and feel like when sitting on that benched area. So here's just a picture from the same spot in my yard, what it looked like before I did my renovations of my yard and then after, and it's still a work in progress. So even though making, putting one rain garden in your yard may sound like a very small step, if we work together as a community and everyone reduces the amount of water leaving their house and we're conserving water together, then we can make some huge changes in our community and ensure that we have water for future generations. And so I'll open it up for questions. I do have a couple of more slides. Um, lastly, for you here, um, The Rainwater Harvesting for Drylands and Beyond is an amazing book. I think they're coming out with a Spanish version of it. So it might be available online now, but I'm just not sure. And then some resources for native plants and then um, my contact information and the Colorado Stormwater Center website. Some contractors um, potentially in your areas that do design and building rain gardens. Um, and then these resources in Spanish. So I will just open it up now. Thanks, Jessica. That was so awesome. I'm really excited to start working on some of these things in my own yard. So. Oh, great. Yeah. Um, we had a question. We always get this question about um, mulches. Uh, what's your take on gravel mulch or like a squeegee? I think everyone has their own perspective. On that. <laughs> yeah. you know, um, there's no perfect answer. It really depends on what you have going on in your yard. I've seen some great examples of like the gravel or the squeegee being used. I haven't used it personally. The reason why is because I like organic mulches because they, they um, de um, degrade isn't the right word, but they um, degrade and then build up the soil. Mm -hmm. And so rock mulch doesn't do that. And it also tends to be hotter and so I like that mulch has like that cooling property and the squeegee can keep more water. I just prefer organic mulches. So especially for rain gardens, if you're doing something like a xeric landscape that has um, just a lot of really low water desert type plants, then that might be a really good solution. But when you're trying to have to keep moisture in an area and kind of infiltrate that water, I recommend shredded mulch or organic mulches. Yeah, exactly. It's kind of our take as well. Um, yeah, I feel like I had a thought there, but I just lost it. Um, all right, any other questions folks from, from, from anyone out there? So we're also working right now um, on a really exciting program um, to create more um, opportunities for installing rain gardens. So we're going to be doing demonstration rain gardens. We're going to be creating um, planting layouts for rain gardens because we know that it can be hard to do your own design. So if you are interested in learning more about that project or potentially accessing some of those designs, um, please email me and they aren't ready yet, but that is something that we're working on um, coming up here soon. Perfect, that sounds great. Yeah. Love that. Um,
Yeah, I guess this um, Jamie's question in the in the chat. Um, I guess that is an interesting question about ideas for incorporating this into like maybe existing raised beds. Um, is are there way? I, I guess in my mind that's more of like the rain um, rain barrel type in setting up um, irrigation hoses off of a rain barrel. But do you have other ideas about beds that might be raised and how to incorporate that? How to incorporate raised beds into rain gardens? Yeah, or rain harvesting and yeah, irrigation into raised beds. I think that's what Jamie was asking. Okay, so to get irrigation into raised beds, um, that is definitely with rain barrels. I kind of can go on a whole tangent about rain barrels and um, watering your flower beds, but there's also things that you can do, like um, you could do a rain chain, there we go, a rain chain to direct it into your um, raised beds. Just make sure that it will kind of spread out instead of going like directly to one spot in your raised beds. Um, so yeah, there's multiple ways to do that. And the only thing that I say with rain barrels and having like irrigation from rain barrels set up, it's not like you can set it like you can with your irrigation controller and then just leave because if there's not enough water in your rain barrel, then it won't um, water it. So you okay. just need to make sure there's enough water in your rain barrel before you like turn it on to irrigate something. So sure. it is it is just more like you have to go out there and do it manually. Yeah, more awareness on that one. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, Someone is asking for your email, but I'm going to share that in the chat or unless you want to go back a couple slides. Maybe Jordan. Actually, I think Jordan just responded to that. Um, <laughs> yes, but you will receive the slide set and it has my email and okay, number. There you go. Jessica.thrasher at colostate.edu. Um, and then just someone's quickly asking, is there a rain garden? There's a rain garden early in the slide set um, that has a bump out into the street. They were curious if it was in Fort Collins near the CSC Gardens. <laughs> it is in Fort Collins. Um, there are several examples of Fort Collins. One of them is off of Shields, and then there are some by the CSU Gardens. I have uh, so many examples of rain gardens in Fort Collins. So if you're interested, we can go look at them sometime if you're in Fort Collins. <laughs> Put up a little map and explore all of them. That would be yeah, cool. Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. Well, I think that's about it in, for questions. Um, yeah, thank you so much. This was super informative. I'm psyched to like dig through these slides again when I have a little bit more time to, to plan and, and finagle my space. So um, thank you so much, Jessica. I really appreciate it. You're welcome. And I just like to say thank you to the Community Language Co-op for being with us today. Thank you, Diego, to the translator and to Resource Central for hosting us. Um, and I will stay on if anyone would like to answer any more questions. I'll just hang out here for a couple of minutes um, if you want to um, ask anything else. So thank you all so much for your interest in this topic. And um, I'm wishing you all rain for your rain gardens and happy planting. Thank you.